So again, I'm Denise Ellsworth with the uh, OSU Department of Entomology, uh, where I coordinate pollinator education. And I'm joined this morning by Marsha Karsten, who is a wonderful facilitator who's been helping with our webinar series. I really appreciate Marsha's help. She's a Xerces ambassador and also a volunteer pollinator specialist in Ohio, volunteering to help other people learn about pollinators. So uh, Marsha, thank you so much. I really appreciate your being here and helping to field questions and with other technical issues. We have several partners who came together to put this series together. We uh, do a lot with the Chadwick Arboretum and Learning Gardens, which is our Arboretum on main campus with OSU in Columbus. And so I wanna recognize uh, Chadwick for, um, for their support of, of uh, these programs. And we also have many bee biologists across the country who've come together to help us out. We have a wonderful slate of instructors for this bee course. Uh, and we're also partnering with the U.S. National Native Bee Monitoring Research Coordination Network, which is quite a mouthful, um, but it's a really robust group of bee scientists across the country who are coming together to focus on bee conservation. And I think a lot of you may have found out about this webinar series through that network. Um, they had an article last year in the New York Times talking about bee conservation and the work of the network, um, started to gather a group of folks who are interested in helping out. And that, that really is what helped bring this webinar series together. So again, on our website, on our B course website, I do have that New York Times article linked as well as the, um, that network uh, website so you can find more, uh, more about that group. So I know here in Ohio and across the region, um, certainly where you are um, across the country and really around the world, folks are turning their attention and concern toward the plight of, of native bees in particular. Um, and so this webinar series is uh, an effort to get us all together to build our skills as community scientists um, and to help us be better observers and data collectors to, um, to feed into the wonderful science that, that bee researchers are, um, are implementing across the world to help with bee conservation. You probably know that our focus for this series for this series is on wild bees and not on honeybees. Um, but if you didn't know that, uh, we are focusing on, um, on the thousands of unmanaged bees, native bees um, across the country and, um, and not specifically about honeybees. That doesn't mean you're not welcome to, to learn more about, about wild bees if your interest is primarily honeybees. Um, but our focus for this series will be um, our wild bees. I do have some funders that I wanted to thank. We have a USDA Pollinator Health Grant through, um, it's an integrated pest management grant through NEFA for uh, Pollinator Health. So I wanna acknowledge those funders. And we also have support for this series from the Davy Tree Expert Company too. So our thanks to, um, to those funders for helping us put this program together. So today's topic is Bee Botany 101, and I'm really excited to have Randy Mitchell with us. Um, Dr. Mitchell is a professor at the University of Akron in, in biology. Uh, and for two years here in Ohio, he was co-leader of the state bumblebee team that looked for the rusty patch, primarily looked for the rusty patch bumblebee across the state. Um, they identified over 20,000 bumblebees, um, gave a really intensive look at which flowers those bumblebees were foraging on um, and where in the state all those bees were. Um, so a great focus here in, um, in Ohio on bumblebees, unfortunately not finding any of the rusty patch bumblebee, but um, shining a light on the plight of bumblebees here in the Buckeye State. His main research interest is evolutionary ecology of plant pollinator interaction. So uh, when we put this series together, uh, Randy's the, really the first one I thought of to, um, to come in and get, give us an overview of uh, what are flowers doing for bees? What are bees doing for flowers? And how can we learn more from uh, for watching them both? So besides his uh, work there on campus at the university, he's also the director of the University of Akron Field Station, uh, which is a really uh, a wonderful place to visit. So Randy, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much for kicking us off and um, tell us about bees and flowers. You bet, uh, just to confirm, you guys can hear and see everything you're supposed to see? Yep, looks great. Great. I, I would hate to be talking into the void that so many of us have encountered here. Uh, it's it's so great to see so many people interested in all this. Uh, it's, it's something that's fascinated me since I was a kid and has uh, been absorbing me ever since. Uh, I, I just like to go out in my garden. Here's I took this video in my garden. 
uh, and we, I bought this plant because I sort of want to have a, a pollinator gymnasium. And you can see that this poor Bombus impatiens is working really hard to get at the food. And the, uh, the effort that she's making is, is going to affect her ability to provision her offspring. You can see the pollen she's carrying on her legs, her little butt sticking out there as she uh, goes in. Looks like I got to move some things here. Um, and now it seems, there we go. She's back to moving. Um, and, and she'll go down there. She's going to get some nectar. She's probably going to get a little pollen. When she comes out, if you look on her face, you'll see that there's a little bit of pollen there that she, rather it's scrape, 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 and that goes back into her pollen baskets. So this is a situation where there's two different types of organisms out here. There's bees that are visiting flowers and there's flowers that are getting visited. And, and neither of these is doing them for no real reason. So let's take a look at, at, at this and, and go a little further because you're gonna hear from the world's experts on bees. And I wanna make sure that you know the, the, the landscape, the, the situations that they're dealing with. Um, as so many times I'm going to do, I'm stealing pictures here. I've never met Elias, uh, but uh, th this is a selection of, of photos posted to Facebook for one of the many interesting wildflower uh, groups This is for Ohio, just of the flowers that Elias was able to see during the month of April. Look at all those different shapes and sizes and colors and arrangements. Uh, it's, it's infinitely varied, and, and each one of these is visited by pollinators. Each one of them, for the most part, is going to only be able to reproduce because of the visits of those pollinators. And in order to, to make sense of what's going on with the plants and to be able to make sense with what's going on with the insects, uh, we, we need to, to know both sides of the equation. And so this is sort of my leaping off point here. And what I wanna do is say, we're gonna work on three main things today. Uh, the, the two sort of stage setters are, about why these plants and why these bees are doing or have producing the things that they do. And then we're gonna sort of dive a little bit into how the flowers work uh, as, as physical artifacts that, are, uh, that appear to have evolved for particular purposes. One of the, the things that will come around is that if you can uh, pay attention to that, you'll be able to identify plants and recognize some patterns that will help you when you're out in the field. And, I want to put a plug in here that one of the really interesting and important things you can do as a citizen scientist is not just know which bees you have, but what food items they're depending on. Um, and from that information, we can get a much better idea of the ecological interactions that are out there. So let's, let's go into question one. Um, why are these bees visiting flowers? I mean, uh, it, it looks like a fun thing to do, but you know very well that they're, they're not there just for the fun of it. They're there because they're, they're pretty, right? Is, is that the answer you give? I, I, maybe. So clearly flowers are very noticeable. To you and me, they're very noticeable because they're colorful. And occasionally we'll catch little whiffs of scent. But the world of a bee, as you're gonna learn from Jamie and other folks, is very different from the world that you and I experience. Uh, their, their abilities in, in vision are different than ours. And their abilities in, in smelling things are way better. They are detecting scents that you and I are completely ignorant of. And so that, that's what we would call the attractants, but that's not why they're visiting. They don't just go to, the, to, uh, to these because they're beautiful. They go there for one main reason. And that's because there's food inside each of these flowers. At the base of this flower, there's nectar. There's also pollen in the anthers. And so in most cases, when you see a flower, to a bee, they're just seeing this, uh, the, the, the attraction of a sign that says, come and get some food here. And mostly that the food's gonna be a, a dilute solution of sugar water called nectar with some amino acids and other things in it. Uh, the pollen, which is the source of protein for their offspring. Uh, Cause you know, th these, these bees, they're, they're, they're fueling their flight by the nectar, but they're, feeding their babies mostly with the pollen. The, the carbohydrates and energy from the nectar will be used in the offspring, but it's that the pollen that's gonna give them the protein that's so hard to get. Now, there's a number of really interesting things going on with other rewards that are in flowers. Uh, I'm not gonna talk a lot about those, except to say that last week in Science Magazine, they pointed out this, this uh, um, orchid, a lady slipper from China, and it turns out that this flower uh, does not produce nectar or pollen, but what it does is it produces hairs on the petals. 
and the, the hairs are filled with uh, oils and other, other resources that are, that are consumed and used to, to both feed the babies and feed the, the adults. So it's not always gonna be the way you, you, you might think. It's not always just a liquid nectar or liquid oil. There's all kinds of weird stuff that's going on. But for the most part, we're talking about a little drop of nectar down at the bottom here and some pollen that's, that's uh, produced up in those anthers. Um, that's kind of the answer for why bees visit flowers. We're done and gone with that one, except that it's the common theme through the rest of, of this talk. Uh, but why plants have flowers is something that we want to spend a little time on because this is your only time to look at this from the point of view. Oh my goodness. These uh, plants are producing flowers uh, that are beautiful and produce all these rewards, but why would they do that? Well, you, you learned long ago, that's because this is all about the birds and the bees. This is the mating that's going on. So look at this, this uh, sedge here, which is not something you'd expect us to talk about when talking about um, uh, uh, bee pollination of flowers. Uh, and you can see the pollen that, that's dropping out of these flowers. That These are going to be produced by sex. This pollen is going to find its way to another flower uh, from the male flowers to female flowers. And it's going to uh, then pollinate this and make some seeds. Uh, but that's depending on the wind, which is not very reliable. And the, you can see the pollen is kind of just going to drop. It's not going to go very far. Um, and, and so the, the wind's really not the strongest way to go about uh, moving pollen around. It's perfectly good. A large number of, of plants, a lot of trees depend on that, uh, but a lot of them uh, have, have, uh, are sort of stuck with that uh, because wind just doesn't do quite the job you need. The um, Another opportunity is that they could just spread vegetatively. I don't know, you, you've, you've planted plenty of plants in your garden where you start in one point and by, by the end of the season, they're at the other end of the flower bed because they can spread underground vegetatively. And that's great. The plant can expand, but it's not gonna be able to have the variety that's necessary for these plants to, um, to continue in a changing environment. And so, one of the things that can happen is if you can move, uh, even with a, a willow like this, there's, there's, there's uh, male plants and female plants. And so the pond can't, it, the wind won't always blow it that well. And so insects will visit these flowers and move it to another one. And that allows them to uh, cross pollinate. But there's a problem because a lot of plants like this lupin here, the, the, it has both sexes in there. So there's gonna be pollen and there's going to be uh, the, the female part. And that's going to um, provide the possibility that pollen's gonna go within this flower. So you're gonna see pollen from this flower go back and back into it and make seeds that are self-pollinated. And you may have heard about this. Old timers like me think of the movie Deliverance where uh, mating of close relatives tends to, to generate um, uh, less high, uh, lower quality offspring. In fact, here's some data from this lupin. So we figured out how many seeds they made and how well they grew and we compared three types of pollination. You're gonna see a little data here because I'm a scientist and I can't help it, um, but they're not too hard. So here's how well the plants are doing. If you let bees pollinate, they, they do very well. Um, if I go to a flower and I uh, add, uh, prevent bees from moving pollen, but then uh, put on some pollen that, from another plant, I, I, the plant does very well, makes lots of seeds that are very healthy. But if instead I add self-pollen, there's a reduction here, and that's called inbreeding depression. And so uh, th that's the problem that comes about. And so a lot of the reason that plant flowers are the way they are is to encourage bees not only to, to move pollen from, uh, uh, from flower to flower, but to move to another plant. Now, I'm going to have to ask you to forgive me because I need to be able to, uh, uh, the, I just have to press a button, and then I have to press another button. There, now I can, uh, I, I can see in the background uh, what's coming because I sometimes have to plan a little, so apologies there. So let's look at this now at, at the plant pollinator interaction. And so we'll take this Bombus vagans here and she's gonna go in and visit some flowers. And we wanna think about what, what's this bee getting out of? We already talked about that. She's getting food. And in this particular uh, case, she's getting both pollen, which you can't see, but her tongue's out. She's, and I know that at the base of this flower down here, and pay attention here, we're gonna see this plant again because it's my favorite. Um, the nectar's way down inside, uh, not inside the petals, way down here. 
She's going to lick it with her tongue, but you can see she's also got pollen on her face that's going to go into her pollen baskets. And so she's getting all kinds of food from this plant. What's the plant getting out of it? Well, here she is. She's been at another plant. She's got white pollen on her face and she's going to visit this flower. This flower has now been pollinated. It's brought in pollen from another plant. And that's a really big benefit because this there's no way the pollen's going to go from this plant to another one or to this plant from another one, uh, unless a bee's moving it because the pollen's too heavy and it's hidden inside the flower. So the wind's not going to do the job. Now, of course, we just learned that the way that pollen comes in, we got the pollen coming in from another plant, but now she goes, she goes to this flower, she's going to get more pollen on her face and she's going to deliver it to this flower. Now, some of the pollen that arrives there is selfed. And that self pollen is going to possibly generate offspring that are less fit in breeding depression. And think about it. She's got a little pollen on her face. Now she'll get even more and go to this flower. By the time she's five or six flowers in there, she's almost only causing self-fertilization. But by the time she gets here, she has a face full of pollen and she'll go to another plant and she's going to move pollen to another one. So this plant is succeeding by both receiving pollen and sending pollen to other plants. And the vast majority of our plants are like this with both, uh, both uh, male and female parts. And so they can, be, they can have sexual reproduction in both directions. If you're paying attention here, you see that there's, there's a, a, um, a conflict going on here. The conflict is that this bee is only there to get pollen or nectar. The plant is only there because it wants pollen to be moved. They've, there's there's a, a sort of a tension here, right? So look, think about the plant. What would the best pollinator be? Well, the best pollinator would be a matchmaker. A best pollinator would never visit another species. It would only visit this one so you don't get any other pollen on there. It would move not just to like the, this one here might be a cousin, right? We don't want to visit, just move a short distance. We want it to move maybe over here where it's a very distant relative so we don't get any inbreeding depression at all. And in fact, what, I, I'm spending a lot of pollen making baby bees. Why would I do that? There's no benefit to me, to at least direct of that. So why would I waste po time making pollen or making nectar or oils or anything? And so from the viewpoint of a, of a plant, the best pollinator is a very different beast than any bee that you've ever met. But there's more. Think about it from the point of view of a pollinator. What would the best flower be? Oh, it would be a, a monkey flower, of course. No, from the point of view of a bee, the best possible feeder would be a feeder. It would be right next to your colony. It would have loads of food. There would be short travel costs because it's so close by. It would be high in nutritional quality. It would be very expensive for a plant to make that and physically impossible to always be next to the, to the nest. So what we've got here, and this is the fundamental issue of, of why you as a bee bot interested person wanna know about plants is that there's a tension between plants and pollinators. Both of them want something that the other has, but is gonna to have to pay to get it. It's like if I go to the bakery, I just want the bread, just give me the bread. And the baker looks at me and says, just give me the money, I just want the money. But we're going to have to meet somewhere in the middle. I'll give the baker some bread, the baker will give me, or did I just say that wrong? I'll give the baker some money and the baker will give me some bread. Neither of us got the ideal situation of a gift but both of us came out satisfied because we use something we have in abundance to get something that someone else has in abundance. Now, obviously no, no brains are being involved with this, this balance, but that's the way the situation works. The bees wouldn't visit flowers that don't have reward and the flowers won't, won't uh, participate if they're not getting what they need either. And so the, the, if you always look at this as a balance, you're going to find it a lot easier to understand what's going on uh, out there in the real world. Now, having said that, you can, you undoubtedly can think of exceptions to what I just said. For example, those those uh, orchids and lady slippers are a good example. Uh, actually, don't produce any nectar, and the pollen is not something that that pollinators gather or really would get much good out of. Instead, they look like somewhere good to eat. They send out the advertisement, but they don't have the reward. 
And so the bee will, uh, especially naive bees, will, will bumble in here, wander around inside this, and then the only way out of this trap is to go out the top end, and that puts pollen on the bee. And if the bee makes the same mistake again, now pollination happens. So there are some cheaters. It goes the other way. You've often seen this where a, a carpenter bees are the best at this. They've got these giant mandibles. Look at the whole, these, these linear slits here. Those have been bit by, by a carpenter bee and this honeybee is taking advantage of that. So it's a double steal here. Um, and so you can see that although the entrance to the flowers down here, the dumb, this honeybee is never gonna contact any reproductive parts. It's not gonna move pollen from flower to flower. And so you will find instances in which the, there are exceptions to this balance being met uh, where, where uh, we're gonna have something that's not quite the cooperative, utterly um, ideal for both of them situation. But most of the time we do find something where the, the, uh, the bees are getting what they need, the plants are getting what they need, but there will be uh, imbalances at times. In fact, let, let me, let me uh, show you more data. I know you can't wait. Um, here's a common situation uh, that we have, and that's if you go to a flower and you add a little more pollen, you'll get more seeds. But eventually you've, uh, you've sort of maxed out, oops, maxed out the flower as far as how it could do. And there's this sort of a saturating relationship um, out there. And what we find is that a lot of times plants aren't making as many seeds as they could if they were fully pollinated. A lot of times, like a lot of times they might get this much pollen. You can see that they're making some seeds, but not as many as they could if, if uh, there was the maximum amount of pollination. So in fact, what we can do is I can go in and add a little pollen. So we take some pollen, we, we put it in a little microfuge tube here and pop it onto the flower and we can triple or quadruple the amount of pollen and we can get all, as many seeds as they could possibly make. And that difference, that little nudge is the difference between that is the extent to which there's pollen limitation. You may have heard about this. So the plant is limited because there's not enough pollen, which means there's not enough bees. And so um, this, we don't, uh, this was known as an idea, but uh, a few years ago, some friends of mine and I got together uh, and, and tried to, to find every study that had ever been published on this, which took a lot of time. And what we found is that this diagram here is about what's the normal situation. Most of the time, plants are getting almost enough pollen, but not quite the ideal amount. There are exceptions, lots of exceptions, but that's the, if you're thinking of the average, usually that's about where the plants are. 80% of the plants are, are in that sort of a range. And that's the message that a lot, a lot of people take, that if we had more bees and help pollen, that'd be good. Not great, it'd be good. If you're interested in having more apples or having more berries or whatever else, having a few more bees would be good. And that's the easy message to take from this. The message that I want you to take uh, of is think about going this way. Suppose you had fewer bees and less pollen arriving, what's gonna happen? The amount, uh, just you know, cut it in half and now we have a massive hit on the number of seeds that, that are made. So losing bees is way worse than adding, than, than the benefit of gaining a few. Because of the, the shape, the, if, for those of you who are statistically inclined, this is Jensen's inequality being demonstrated by, by whenever there's this kind of a, uh, a shape where losing is gonna be a bigger deal than gaining. So from a, uh, the, the, we often talk about the value of bees to the natural world and, and this is one of the ways where you, you, if you add a little bit more of them, they're already doing such a good job, you're not gonna really see their value. It's only when you lose them that you'll really notice. Um, yeah, it's, it's a little disappoint, uh, um, discouraging, but that's, the way, that's what the data are telling us right now. All right, so that's sort of this context. What I wanna do is sort of dive into some of the weird stuff that, that, uh, that works with plants. And, it is very possible that uh, you had the unfortunate experience in, in school of, of somehow getting the idea that all that botanists do is make up words. Um, and it's not completely untrue, but that's because flowers are really different than every, the animals that most of us spend most of our time working with. 
And in order to describe them adequately, we they, they have new structures and we're going to need new terms. So I'm going to absolutely keep the terminology to the minimum I can, but you got to know a few words for two reasons. One of them is because they're useful. And the other one is because if you try to figure out what a plant is and go to any source, they're almost always going to use these words. And so if you just have that little working vocabulary, you can go a long way. Uh, but but uh, we'll, we'll, so we'll start with that. So if you're talking about plants, one of the things you first want to talk about is the pistil, the female part. So that's this green dude here in the middle. And it's, it's made of a number of parts. It's, uh, it's, it's called a pistil. The, it's sometimes called the carpal. There's the stigma where the pollen arrives and then the style which separates the arrival to the destination. The destination is down here, what's gonna become a seed. It's called an ovule and it's in what's called an ovary. And so this is a kind of a racetrack for the pollen to grow down to fertilize that seed. We'll talk a lot more about that in a little bit. Outside that is a ring of things called anther, uh, stamens, which are, have two parts, anthers and filaments. I'm, I'm going kind of fast because I'm, I'm not trying to have you memorize this. I want to remind you because I bet most of you have heard most of this. Um, so there's a ring of, of male parts. So those are the two sex pieces. Beyond that, there's some attraction. There's petals, which are colorful and big most of the time. And, and so we'll pay attention to them. If you talk about, all, it's useful to have a word for all the petals rather than just calling them petals. So they'll, they'll sometimes call that the corolla. Uh, and then outside that is what's often, but not always a, some green protective stuff. So when you see a bud, this is the stuff that, that protects the flower. And those are called the sepals, uh, which collectively get the word calyx. And you're gonna run into those terms. Those, th those there, you're gonna, you're gonna bump into those a whole bunch. Um, receptacle comes up once in a while, mostly if you're eating strawberries, because that's what you eat when you're eating the strawberry. It's the thing that holds the pistols and, the, and for that matter, the other parts. And, and you can see, uh, there's a lot of words up here I'm not gonna talk about. Those of you who know them are gonna smile knowingly. Those of you who don't, ignore them, please. They're just there sort of as background. And because this was a great picture. Now, you, you sort of see this, this is sort of built as a series of rings. There's a ring of sepals, there's a ring of petals, there's a ring of anthers or, or stamens. And there's a, there's a sort of a central ring that has to do with the female parts. And it turns out that that's not uninformative. That's a useful way to look at this. They call them whorls, W-H-O-R-L. Uh, and, and so let's go look at a magnolia. Magnolias are similar to what we think some of the ancestral flowering plants were like. And so you see them here, they got bunches of petals. In fact, the sepals look a lot like petals. And for that matter, the, the sepals and the petals kind of look like leaves. And so the, the hypothesis is that evolutionarily long ago, all these reproductive parts were once individual. So this would be one leaf, this would be one leaf, this would be one leaf, this would be one leaf. So there's lots of separate little pistols that, that would be would ancestrally have been, been what they call homologous to leaves. And then there'd be all these stamens that were ancestrally homologous to that. And, and you can kind of imagine if you, if you took a, 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 um, a, you know, a spyglass that, you, that, that a pirate would use and you slam it together and imagine that that's what you did to a branch on a tree, all the leaves would kind of bunch up, but there'd be a whorl that was specialized for each different structure. And so uh, these are the, this is the general way of thinking about it. And it's really useful to, uh, if you recognize this, to look at flowers uh, as versions of this telescoped branch. In fact, let's go and we'll just talk about pistols right now because that's the, the, this is where it's especially useful. Uh, imagine a fern, remember ferns and they've got those spores on their leaves. They're not flowering plants, but the ancestors of flowering plants were kind of like that. They had these, these um, uh, reproductive bits on a leaf. And the, the hypothesis is that it was like that, but then for one reason or another, the leaf folded over. And then millions of years later, that inside would be these, what would become the seeds because they're what comes out of these reproductive structures. And we've got a pistil, one carpal. So they call them carpels. It's a, a folded leaf. And if you look at, so think of a, think of a bean, think of, think of a green bean or a pea 
in, in its, and, and so there, that, that this is a, a single fruit called a legume. It's one of these, what we imagine to be an, uh, have ancestrally been a folded over leaf and inside are each of the single seeds that are produced there. And so that's the way to think about this. Um, in fact, if you do a cross section through, you can kind of, it, it, there's even some, some hints that maybe, remember the strings you get on your green beans? That's these, these two veins of, uh, well, veins of veins the, the, that provide the, uh, the fruit with its resources, but also are where the, the ancestral the leaf folded over on the mid vein and then where the two sides came together. So you may find that a little silly, but look at this one and tell me if that doesn't come in useful. So maybe you've seen marsh marigolds or if, if any buttercup is a lot like this. So here's the flower that you can see the sepals and petals are both yellow and they're out here. And then here's this ring of anthers. And then here's a bunch of individual separate carpels, which are each one a pistil that has a stigma. Here's at the tip where the pollen arrives, a little tiny short runway. And then here's where all this, the developing seeds will be in this cross section when we cut it open. And if you wait a little while, Look at this, here's all, in this case, there's what, eight separate carpels, each with a number of seeds in them. And there's this, there's the stigma, there's the style, there's the main ovary with each of those ovules. And so it's, it's, it's uh, a useful way of thinking about it. Um, there's a lot of special words for this I'm not gonna tell you, but you can read as well as I can. And if you already know this, you've read it quickly. And if you don't, don't worry, you don't need those words. Um, but in some groups, that uh, uh, rather than having the, the carpels being separate, they've fused together. But, and if you've ever uh, cut uh, any number of flowers in, in, in ha uh, crossways, cutting up your bell pepper, you've seen these little chambers. And each one of those was one of three folded over leaves that, that evolutionarily became these carpels. And there you can see them in the fruits. So it shows up in fruits a lot. And here we can see petals and sepals that are similar. You've got the female part in the middle here. And when then we cross it over, slice it through the, they call those locules, which is a sort of a fun little word. And it's one of the, uh, a useful thing. If you go to any of the technical keys for identifying things, they're gonna want you to, to know how many carpels are there. And so this is an easy way, go and slice it. In fact, here's my quick guide to that. If you find yourself in one of those things and they wanna know how many uh, carpels there are, just remember that, that, that it's asking how many of these leaf structures there were. Sometimes the styles are separate, but the stigmas are, 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 are uh, I'm sorry, the styles are, and stigmas are separate. Sometimes the styles fuse together, but you can still see at the tip that there's three little lobes. That tells you how, that, that you also find three lobes inside the ovary, even if you don't slice it open. So you can see over this one, there's two, one, two. Over here, one, two, three, four, five each of them filled with lots of ovules. Uh, so slicing open a flower is a great thing to do. And I'm gonna urge you to do that in just a, a minute or two. Um, another thing, if you're doing the identification, you're, get, you're gonna run into some, term, uh, some terms you just can't get away from. And they're really archaic and they're really confusing and they're, but they are there and they describe a really important part of plant biology. Uh, they, and, but they don't assign anything about whether it's good or not. And that's this word superior and inferior. Um, that has to do with where the ovary is relative to where the sepals and petals are. So here, this, this one here, you can see the sepals and petals both connect below the ovary. Here's the nice cross section of the ovary. Don't you love these wonderful pictures these people have made? Um, and, and they connect under, and then here's the, the pedestal that holds it. And so compared to how it attaches to the plant, this is superior or above where the petals and sepals and everything else come in. This is a really similar flower, but look at this. Here's the, 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 the uh, pedestal. So this is where, where we're basing our, our um, reference to. Here's the sepals and petals. They connect here above the ovary. And so we, uh, we call the ovary inferior there. Um, the technical terms that are not superior and inferior are ugly and hard to remember. These uh, are, are common everyday words that you can use pretty well, but don't get confused that it means that they're better or worse. It's just how they're held. And um, I'll stop with that. 
So that's a sort of a, a whirlwind tour through the female part. And for most of what I'm doing here, I'm mostly talking about how these plants achieve sexual reproduction. So let's talk about the male part here. Um, the stamen has the, the two parts, remember the anther and the filament. And I think it's useful to think about, and, and here's, here's some that are open, here's some that are closed, and here's some scanning electron. This one's just barely open, see that seam there? And then this one's wider open of the very same uh, anthers. Um, I think it's useful to think about a anther as being a football, a laced football. When it's unopened, it's, it's like a regular old football. But if you were to, for some reason, unlace it and then fold the football out flat, that's what happens when an anther opens. And so all the stuff that was inside, in the case of a football, it's air, but in the case of an anther, it's going to be the pollen grains that have developed there. Now they are exposed and available to be harvested and hopefully moved to it uh, by bees and hopefully moved to another plant. So, I mean, the hibiscus is great because the pollen is gigantic in hibiscus. Look at each of those spiny, little, uh, the shapes of pollen grains are crazy. Uh, they, they have all kinds of shapes that I won't even talk about, uh, but the, here they are, they're all exposed and now a bee bumps against that and the pollen's gonna stick on it. Same with all these other, in fact, go back and look at the magnolia. The, the anthers and are really like leaves. They look a lot like leaves. It's, the parts are not that distinguished here. Uh, they, they haven't uh, taken that road. So uh, this pu puts the pollen out there and uh, it is available for pollinators to meet. And there's all kinds of, of interesting things about it. like these unzip. So uh, in, in the first three hours, only the tip will be unzipped. Uh, in the next three hours, some more pollen will become available. So that's, there's more pollen available to the next pollinator. So it's not putting all the pollen out at once, but, but some a little at a time. There's other ways of doing, of doing things like that too. For the plant is adjusting how the bee will interact with the flower. Um, here's some, one, I, I used to study these plants. I'd love them. They're out in California. So, uh, several penstemons that uh, Mary Castellanos and a couple others did some amazing work on. So here's... Penstemon pseudospectabilis, mostly visited by hummingbirds. Look at, here's the anthers and you can see they're still the, the, the unopened version, but this one here, they have opened. You can barely see, if you look close, you can see right at the tip here, they've opened and they're sort of hanging like upside down Frisbees. Here's a, a, a from underneath a look of this under high magnification. You can see some pollen left in there, but it's just a, a Frisbee. So they, they stick, even though it's upside down, they don't fall because they're a little sticky, but if, an animal comes in and bumps against that, pollen's gonna get stuck to it. And in that case, a hummingbird probably. Now, that's uh, if you go to one of the closest relatives of that particular penstemon over with P penstemon spectabilis, and you look at these anthers, they don't, they don't look as big and flat as that. And, and if you look over here, you see that the style is sticking out with a stigma at the tip of it. So the bee's gonna come in and bump those. But when you look at those under uh, magnification, they're not gonna let much pollen go at once. The bee will come in and scrape against it and it'll get the surface pollen, but there's still some in, in there and it'll shake, it'll loosen up and come down. And so each bee will get a little more pollen. The idea is that this is a way the pollen is, uh, the pollen, the, the plant is affecting how pollen is moved by pollinators. In the first one, most of the pollen just goes on the first visitor and then it's done. On this one here, each visitor, maybe 10, 20, 30 visitors, and there's still a little pollen going each one. And that plant turns out to have a lot of visitation. This other one gets visited once or twice a day. This one gets visited once or twice an hour. And so this allows the, the, bee, the plant to put pollen on many different bees that will go to many different possible mates. See how that matches the, the, the uh, matchmaker view of what an ideal pollen would be. So the plant is forcing the bee to be a little bit more like a matchmaker, even though the bee would love to get all the pollen at once. I bump that, bump that, doggone it. Give, uh, I will continue. Uh, there seems to be a loose wire under my desk that when I get relaxed and start to talk to you, I bump. Um, so I will just press this and then press this and I think I can get back to where I was. Okay, so um, this is taken to great lengths by the tomato family. You may have heard about this. The tomatoes are, they have a long skinny anther and it's only by 
uh, a bee, if, if a bee bumps up against this, like a honeybee that doesn't do anything special, won't get any pollen. But if a bee uh, comes in and vibrates its wing muscles, pollen will fall out of it. In fact, they have to pit, fit roughly middle C to hit the right vibration frequency so the pollen falls out. And this is called buzz pollination. Uh, uh, you, you can't hear, it turns out, I can't play my, oh well, I have a video that's now, uh, although it's worked in every practice I've ever done, it won't play that video. Uh, these are uh, some bees doing the, the, the buzzing and you'll have to go out and watch your tomatoes uh, or your verbascum or a number of other plants uh, to, to see that. Um, this is the slide where I tell you to ignore all the words. What you need to know is that because plants are very different from animals, the way that they arrange their sexual uh, lives is very different than that of most animals. And there are, it, therefore, we need a lot of special words to describe that. I'm only going to give you two words that I want you to pay attention to because they're the most confusing. And then there's a bunch of long ones that go read the book. Um, now it's not the thing, it, but they all have to do with whether there are male parts or female parts or both in any particular flower and whether they're on the same plant or different plants. The two, the two words are perfect and imperfect. Perfect means the flower has both male and female parts, the flower. And the imperfect means that it's all male or all female. And then there are, there are variations of that theme that I'm not going to tell you about because it's really not, uh, from the bee's point of view, what matters is, is there pollen there or nectar? And usually what you'll find, the male flowers are gonna have pollen. That's, that's pretty much known. Uh, the, the flowers that are only female often will, will have nectar. And that's kind of all I'm gonna say about that. I think it's useful now to talk about the advertisement portion of the flowers. And uh, you're gonna run into all kinds of words that are, that are synonyms for there's a right and a left side versus the flower looks the same from every angle. So we call that bilaterally symmetric or radially and there's technical terms for that. That's a big deal because the shapes of the flower, whether it's symmetric or not, determines how the bee will interact with it. This one, uh, the ones on the right here, if it's radially symmetric, the bees will probably come in and it'll probably make a full circle around that but it's not gonna come from any one particular angle. And the flowers are often built so, uh, so that the, its functions will be fulfilled that way. Whereas if it's zygomorphic, the, I'm sorry, if, if it's bilaterally symmetric, the bee is gonna come in from a particular angle every time. Um, on top of that, there's, uh, there's the petals and, and or the sepals might be fused with one another to make tubes or other structures. And that's gonna affect the way the, the the insect interacts with it. And with both of these features, what you wanna pay attention to is how does this affect the way the bee interacts with the flower and how pollen gets onto the bee and off of the bee. Uh, and, and so you can see that some of these may be radially symmetric, but have a, a deep tube. So it, make, it means only certain types of animals will be able to get access to the nectar that's at the bottom. Others are gonna have uh, all kinds of ways of controlling the behavior of the bee. Uh, and the most, the, the, the most famous one, and you've run into this tons of times, is the length of the tongue of the bee determines whether it can visit, like this bee here is a nice long tongue, very much like this one here, uh, and, and nice long tongue. And so it can go in this tubular flower and get the nectar. This one here could never reach that. She has just a little short stub of a tongue. Um, I, I have to take a moment here to say that you've probably heard that there are certain families of bees that have long tongues and certain families of bees that have short tongues. And that's completely true, except that it's not. There are, uh, that has to do with the structure of the tongues and, that, and as you will be told, no doubt, by your, the, the bee experts who will be coming on. Sometimes, even though it's in a short-tongued bee family, it'll have a longish tongue. There's variation, it has to do with the structure of the, uh, the way the tongue is put together, that, that's that. But it's a good shorthand. But don't be fooled to think that, the own, that, that it's, uh, it's restrictive that way. The, the, a long tube can sometimes be got by helictans, the famous short tube 
uh, short-tongued bees, because some of them turned out to have a pretty long tongue for a holectin. Um, and usually this has to do with where the nectar is. So here's a violet. I don't know if you ever sliced a violet lengthwise. It's kind of kooky. Um, first off, it's got all these hairs. This is a, a side. So hairs usually mean that there is scent being produced. And so uh, that, that's, this is, this is a, an important feature, but the bee is going to come through the, going to crawl through, the head's going to be hitting the, the, but then going to go with the tongue underneath down here to hit this structure, uh, it's, which is sort of adjacent to the anthers. And this is what's called a nectary. Now nectaries, this is a good, better view of one. They're often going to glisten. This is what you're looking for because it's got a little, lick, it's seeping just a little bit of, of uh, fluid out there, sometimes a lot of fluid that will show up often in a sort of, of a spur or, or a little pocket that lets it accumulate. And so that's where they're getting the food from. There's a lot of details to this that can vary. Um, I think it's useful to look at a plant like this. So the nectar is produced down here. It's hard to tell. This is a monkey flower. Um, and think about it. the bee's gonna go through, and you've already seen uh, several monkey flowers. This is a different species. The bee's first, for it's first gonna contact the stigma that will act like a, a mop it'll wipe some pollen off of the bee, and then it'll contact the two anthers and reload with pollen while it licks down here, gets the nectar. They don't really suck much, they're mostly licking. Um, and then we'll go out. Uh, an interesting feature of the Western monkey flowers is that this stigma, in the time between the bee going in and coming out, the stigma will close and get out of the way so it doesn't wipe pollen off the bee on the exit, which, uh, exit, which allows the bee to carry more pollen away. You see the plants, have lots of features that are optimizing their end of the tension. All right. Um, sometimes the, the, the nectar will be put in spurs, like the columbines are good examples of that. Or for that matter, uh, also linaria ha has a nice long nectar spur. Now, the other th feature about advertisements is having all that color. And you guys know lots of all the beautiful colors. But pay attention to the fact that the colors are not always just uniform. They're pointing something like, look at this flower. Where do you want to go? Where is the action? This thing is pointing. I want you to put your nose here because that's where the nectar is. And here, there's, there's all kinds of structures that are, are pointing to. So these are called nectar guides. So aside from the overall color that's attractive, the nectar guides are going to uh, allow these bees to find what they need. And because bees can't uh, see things we don't see, like ultraviolet light, there, there are nectar guides that you and I can't see. So black-eyed Susans have a black eye, but did you know that they also have black eyeliner? And, and, but only if you can see UV. And the, even that monkey flower we were just seeing, Mimos scutatus, it has a, a lot of nectar guides and dots that allow organisms to see, even though to you and me, it looks plain, it's, there's something going on there. Now, Denise and I, had a good long talk about how to do this talk uh, for, for you to get you where you wanted to go. And our initial idea was that we, you should all come in with a flower in hand and then dissect it. And I've done that. Here's an example. Problem is it takes a long time to dissect a flower and really know what you're doing. So you'd all be focused on the flower you've got. And I'd be sort of sitting here twiddling my thumbs while you did that. So go outside, grab a flower, take it apart. This is what we did. I taught Flora this past fall um, with COVID. So I had to tell students what to do for their labs at home in part. And so I said, go find a flower, tear it apart and make me a guide. So here's, uh, here's the plant in its natural habitat because this is cultivated, it's my garden. Um, here's the flower. Now I've got all the parts separated out and I've labeled them with all the funny terms that we've talked about and tried to identify all the, the relevant elements. Go out and do that. You will never learn more than when you do that and get out a lens look at those things in detail. You'll see everything we're talking about and you'll understand way more about what's going on. And almost every time I get surprised by what I see when I tear them apart. It's like looking at bees with a microscope. You see things that you would never see otherwise. And because you've seen them under magnification, you will see them without magnification later on because you've sensitized yourself. Um, let me give you a quick tour of uh, how this works for my favorite plant, this, uh, this plant here in wetlands of uh, the Eastern US. So here, here's uh, one of our, our fan, uh, friends visiting this flower. She's gonna leave and she's gonna go to another one. So let's see what happens from the plant's point of view during this process. So here she comes, look at her. 
She is carrying all that white pollen. It's just all over her face. She's gonna go in, she's gonna hit that mop that's dangling down, because here it is, here's the stigma. Here's the anthers with pollen in them. She's gonna stick her tongue down. Here's little hair, so it's probably some scent involved. And then in, in she'll go. Now, let's for a moment, let's look at the bee point of view. I tried to get fancy here. So in, in we zoom, and she's got all that pollen. But if you look at there, she has one of the ear, uh, earmarks is the wrong word, but one of the key features of bees is that they have uh, hair that's feathery. And here you can see how that helps hold on to the pollen. So she holds, if a wasp was to stick her nose in, wouldn't have nearly as much pollen on her. The bees are great at getting pollen. Now that's because she wants to put in her pollen baskets, but that still means a lot's gonna be sticking to her when she goes into the flower. So now let's go to that stigma and zoom in. So here's the stigma, right? The tip of the, of the there, here's the style. Here's the ovary hidden behind the fused sepals. See how all those terms came in handy? And, and I sort of drew in some dotted lines here so you can see what's going on. Uh, we've gone and painted in where the pollen is. It's on that lower part of the dust moppy element of this uh, stigma. Um, here's the pollen grains when we zoom in on them. There's in between what are called stigmatic papillae, little bumps. And as the, when the pollen gets there, they absorb water from the, from the uh, stigma and that allows them to swell. They look like little beach balls in this particular species. Each pollen looks a little different. And then it will it, uh, germinate and produce a pollen tube. So it's growing to form this. It's sort of like a, 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 the hyphae of a fungus. It's going to go down and it's going to get into the surface of the stigma and start to go down so that it can make the long trip down the style here. That's a long ways. How long is it? Well, this pollen grain here is about a hundredth of a millimeter in size. It's tiny. It's about 10 millimeters from the stigma to the ovary. So that's a thousand body lengths. And this, this pollen grain is going to be producing its own tunnel to move two little nuclei. There's, there's what's called generative nucleus. And then there's the sperm nucleus. So inside this, it's going to sort of, in this tunnel it makes, it's going to push forward the two nuclei, build a wall, push, the, push forward the nuclei, build a wall. And so it's keeping this constant volume of, of its cell contents as it goes along, but it's, it's having to make this. You, you can't, there's not enough juice here, not, not enough protein, not enough carbohydrate to make that happen. So about this far down, it's the, the pollen grains are starting to upload resources from the, the plant, the female plant. So we talk about the male pollen and female plant here because the pollen's from another plant. They're uploading, it's like an army foraging across uh, a, uh, as on a forced march. And so they're, they're bringing on resources from, from there. And of course the, the plant has the opportunity to, to maybe provision this pollen grain more than that one. And that's one of the ways that, uh, that there can, the plant can determine who the father of the seeds will be. Uh, it's also worth noting that at this point here, some plants are able to detect which pollen grains are self or cross and stop them from germinating entirely or stop them after they've germinated and grown just a little bit. Uh, so there's a lot of plants are doing th things biochemically that you don't know about. So I'm gonna zoom in on this area here and this area down here uh, and use a different technique. This is scanning electron microscopes. Uh, this is uh, staining with, with a something that that uh, only stains pollen tubes and pollen grains. So here's the pollen grains, each one of them making a pollen tube. And since there's thousands of pollen grains, there's thousands of pollen tubes, which is a good thing because when we go down into the ovary here, there are these dots are the ovules that could become a seed if they get fertilized. And so here come the pollen tubes. They're all grouped together so we can't tell one from another. And then each one of them is going to find an unoccupied ovule, a very serious navigational challenge. And Pollen grains that are good at that will be represented in the next generation. And those that aren't, won't. Um, it is a, a mystery to me how they are so good at occupying all those ovules. Um, let me move on because I think I'm a little behind time uh, because of my snafus. So uh, what we get here is, here's the monkey flower seeds. There's about 5,000 and a fruit. It's pretty amazing. Uh, lupin, which we've seen in several other slides, only five seeds in a fruit, enormous variation. Plants are just kooky that way. 
and, and I, I, I want to um, briefly point out that if you start off with a bud, it's going to become a flower that will then become a fruit. And, and so it, it, I've discovered with my students that I sometimes have to, to point out, yeah, buds, flowers, fruits, they're all the same thing at different stages in, in its life. And I'm not going to talk about uh, fruit names. They're, they're complicated. Um, in the time available uh, to me, and, and uh, Denise, do feel free to just say, Randy, you should shut up because uh, you know, I, I can go on a long time. Um, uh, I, I think pointing out some of the ways pollination works in different families of plants is worthwhile. Um, and the families are ways of uh, organizing the diversity of plants. You know, there's families of bees. What are there, six or I think seven families of bees, depending on how you slice it. We got 450 families of plants. So there's a lot of variety out there. But this is a really useful unit. Uh, actually, in bees, families, a hard group to uh, thing to work with. Genera is probably uh, in some ways similar to family. Uh, and many of you know many genera of bees and you know there's a gestalt to them. You just look at me and say, oh yeah, I know that's, that one's a helictid, I know that. Uh, and, and there are the same sorts of fundamental patterns in plants. And so I'm gonna point to a couple of them uh, of these families that might be useful. I will for also point you, this book is amazing. I use it all the time. It's just very, easy to understand and, and on target, very, very up to date and, and correct, but also um, it's very um, easy to read and kind of fun. It, it doesn't talk about pollination much, so I'll give you that angle here, uh, but do do that. And by the way, I also, among the many people I've stolen pictures from is Bob Clips at OSU. Uh, he has a delightful website that actually does talk a lot about uh, the uh, families of plants and he does it first. He's amazing photographer. Second off, he's got a great sense of humor. At least he's got a sense of humor I like. It's kind of quirky. I really enjoy that. Go visit him. He's cool. Uh, and it, it, it'll give you a lot of the kinds of stuff I'm talking about here. Um, here's a great family of plants. The rose family. It's got apples. It's got strawberries. It's got all kinds of plants that you and I are used to. And if you look at the flowers, they're all kind of similar. Look at this one. Look at this one. Look, they're similar. There's, they got some, there's some features about the numbers of petals and sepals and the, the fact that they're radially symmetric and that the petals aren't fused. And uh, if you want to identify them below the family level, you pay a lot of attention to the female parts because they can be arranged in many different ways. But if once you know the rose family, you know roses with only one problem. That's your problem. The rose that you are used to is exactly the wrong thing to think about when you're thinking about rose, the rose family. Think of the strawberry. Think, think of other ones. This, uh, I'll, I'll, I have a word to describe the rose flower, and that's monstrosity. This is a dreadful perversion of a good, honest rose. Because, and what they've done here is they've bred for what humans want to see. So they've kind of said, what would, uh, if a bee was to say, what would a flower be like? It would be to breed a very funny looking flower. We bred something that's, what would I like to see in a flower? And that's something with lots of petals and lots of smell, but that doesn't do what the plant needs, does it? It's, in fact, where are the anthers? Where did they go? Where they went is that they've been uh, bred in, so that instead of producing anthers, they produce petals. So it's, it's, it's a useless thing. They're pretty and you know, my wife has some in the garden. They're, they're, that's okay to have things for pretty, but if you're trying to support bees, this is the wrong thing to do. And if you're trying to learn to identify plants, this is a bad starting point. But the, the, look, at, look at these rose flowers, things that you guys know, uh, berries and apples and strawberries and, and uh, wild ones. And you look at them and you can see they're all gonna be visited by bees in a similar way. They got lots of anthers. You're gonna to have to scrabble around to get the pollen. In some cases, sometimes they get sort of clumped together, the flowers. And so, oh, it won't play my media anymore. So sometimes they'll, oh, that's gonna suck. I've got some really nice video I wanted to show you. Um, in fact, I'll, I'm gonna try something here. Now I'm dead. Oh, well, 
Um, so uh, sometimes if you have you have a spirea and you see them, they're going to zigzag across this because they're not even visiting individual flowers. They're just scraping up the pollen off those anthers and in the process, moving lots of pollen onto stigmas. Okay, another great family to know about uh, are the mints. And uh, the mints are really easy to recognize. And if you look at them, they're all bilaterally symmetric. They've, they've got fused petals and the flowers are usually clustered up in a sort of a, of a clump of some sort. Um, there's some other stuff there. They're gonna have that smell that uh, so many of our spices are in the mint and that goes to the flowers too. And, and uh, this is a, a really important family for bees. It's not gonna play my, oh well, we're just gonna skip that. Um, but the, the, the bees, although when, the, when they visit um, rose family plants, they're just gonna sort of wander around on that big open flower. Oh, I have to press this button here. Um, when they go into a, a, this is where the video, the whole reason I started doing videos was I wanted to show you the one that shows what happens when a bee visits a, a, a salvia. In the salvia, here's the anther, here's the filament, and then it attaches to the flower here, but then below it, there's a little extension. That's where the bee has to put her tongue to get to the nectar down here. And when she pushes that, you can see if there's a fulcrum here and she pushes, the anther will come from up here and pap her on the back. Go out and do, if you have salvia in your yard, just go out there with a, 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 a stem of grass and push in there and the, it'll drop down. It's like a, a, little, uh, a little trap. Amazing, amazing biology that happens with that. Um, and if, yeah. I'm very angry I don't have that slide. Oh, well. Um, if you uh, want another good family, let me see, where's my, uh, a very important family for uh, our, Denise, should I shut up? I'm, I'm what, over an hour. Uh, Randy, why don't you take another uh, five and kind of wrap up? We have a couple questions. You've answered a lot of questions as we went, but a, a couple that uh, many people had. And uh, folks, if you need to hop up, I, I understand that we'll have the recording available and we'll send everybody the link. So go ahead, Randy. Thank you a ton. Uh, and I think that's about how much time I've got left. I, I, I built this to cut short, but I don't want to give short shrift to the, the sunflower family. It's a really important group. If you're uh, the kind of person who's taking a bee class, you probably know that this is not one flower. This is not one flower. It's an, this is one of the biggest families of plants we got, but it's each of what we call a sunflower head, it, it, it has a technical name of capitulum, but it's made up of flowers. Each of these items here and each of these dots here are individual flowers. And the, each of these is one flower with one petal. Let's dive in. So if you take this thing apart, look here. I see that's, that's, a, that's a stigma. There's a style. There's the anthers clustered around the style. And then here's some petals that have been fused to have five lobes. And then down here, look, this is the ovary. And, and Bob Clips has nicely labeled all that for us. This is one flower. And so there's bunches of flowers here and then those. And so when you're looking at a sunflower, uh, you'll see that the bees don't treat it as one big flower. They are visiting a whole bunch of flowers that are conveniently grouped together. But they, each flower, they, if they want to get the nectar, which is almost always produced at the base of the petals, they're going to have to go to each one individually. And by doing that, they're going to cross, bring pollen into the stigma and then pick up pollen where the anthers are because they have to stick their nose down through there. Um, and so what looks like sepals on the outside are, are actually modified leaves uh, called fillaries. Oops, that was another term. I didn't want to drop that one. Um, so the, what you're looking for is to make sure, because you know this is one flower because it's got all the parts. It's got the, the female part, it's got the male part, it's got the petals and then the, the sepals, which have been changed into something else. But if you go to this flower here, you go to the middle, you're gonna see a mishmash of that. You're not gonna see that those whorls that we talked about earlier. Now the pollination there is kind of weird. And what, we're, uh, what you're gonna do is realize that we've got, here's a bud 
And then this one here, you can see here, the, the petals have opened and the anthers are sticking up and above that is an unopened stigma. And the anthers all face in, inward. And so let's do a cross section here. Here we are, there's the style with a stigma at the tip. Here's the anthers, they're gonna open up. And so as the style elongates, it's got little hairs on it in this particular species and it's gonna grab the pollen that's on the anthers and display them. And so the pollen's being presented what they call secondary pollen presentation. Um, and even if they don't have the brush there, the, 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 it's gonna be pushed out as this. And if this uh, video was working, uh, it would uh, show th these anthers, uh, the, these flowers maturing and pushing out their pollen. Uh, by the way, uh, if you're at all interested in the plant end of this, go listen, visit the website and, and uh, listen to podcasts of In Defense of Plants. Uh, Matt Candace does amazing things there and, he, uh, and uh, has a nice section. This is where I stole this video, but the, where he stole this video from has fantastic stuff, but it's very long and, and it wouldn't even show today. But yeah. Uh, I'm a big fan of finding cool ways to see uh, uh, plants and Matt, Matt uh, in defense of plants does that. All right. Um, so the, I think the last one I'll cover very briefly, actually most of it's video. Uh, so I'll make it quite short. Uh, the, the bean family plant, really noticeable. They make beans. So that's, uh, you know, the lupin and the, and, uh, the, the other beans we've seen are all like that. Uh, most of them in our re now, this is where Denise kind of misled me. I thought that I was giving an Ohio talk, and so this part here is is custom to Ohio. I know in the other areas of the uh, of the world there are other members of the bean family, but almost all of ours in our area are going to have this form, the, the the papillionaceous flower with a banner that sticks up like this one here, and then two sort of wings sticking out, and then a keel uh, that hides within it all the anthers and the stigma. And that gives a lot of versatility for variety of how to grow these, uh, how, to, how to get pollinated. Um, with, in many cases, it's just a tube. So uh, these, these flowers are all uh, of these various bean family plants and they just stick their nose in there, look up the nectar, pick up some pollen and they will brush up against that column of stuff of, of reproductive parts. Uh, but if my video was working, you would see a bee visiting these lupins and putting their nose in and then pushing these banner, uh, I'm sorry, pushing these wing petals out of the way. And then the uh, keel would emerge. Uh, and, and I would then show you using a pencil to do it by hand, but I can't do that either. So I have to press this button. So here's what you get if you, if you uh, go in. So I pull off one of the wings here and then I zoom in and pull off the keel and you see inside there, there's all the anthers and there's the style and, uh, and stigma. And what we see is when the, when the bee gets on here and puts any weight on this, it's gonna push it down. And since this, uh, the geometry is such that that that's, is gonna push forward and squirt pollen out the tip like a syringe, which is utterly cool. Um, in other plants, and uh, I would show a movie that I stole from PBS here, in alfalfa, it's actually a spring-loaded trap, and the the, the column will uh, will snap up and hit them. And there's great videos if you go see this bee gets punched in the face for your ice cream. Just Google that up, and you see a great video on that. Um, you'll see uh, I, I, the end result here is that the plant families I've just talked to you are the plant families that we find are most important. Uh, for bumblebees, and uh, we need to do a similar survey for other bees to see what the most important groups are. But that's one of the reasons I chose those families. And I'll skip this family. And I will just conclude by saying, uh, first off, I hope I've demonstrated to you that bees are visiting flowers just to get food, and that flowers are using uh, plants are using flowers to reproduce, and that and that there's a tension between the two of them. And if you recognize that, you're going to be able to better interpret what's going on as you see bees and and plants working with one another. Um, it's also uh, a, the visitation of pollinators that's really important for plants. Uh, the other thing is that these flowers are really intricate structures that can work in a variety of really cool ways. Uh, and as a result, they, in, uh, they can encourage bees to act in ways that help their pollination. 
And I thank you very much for your patience with my technical challenges. And I will stop sharing my screen. Great, thanks so much, Randy. You know, I, we've all been on Zoom so much that uh, there, there's always Zoom glitches. <laughs> it's just which Zoom glitch we're gonna face each day is the question. So um, thank you so much. I think you've motivated lots of us to go out and take a new look at our flowers, watch the bees on them, um, try to, um, the perspective of all of those uh, botanical elements and um, so large and really explaining what was happening. I thought that was really great. Um, there was a question that came up uh, multiple times, and I thought maybe you could just spend a minute to address how, uh, how pollen and nectar are produced, um, how they're replenished, and how bees know that. There were quite a few people who um, had a similar question there. Oh, man, you, uh, uh, how much time you've got. So <laughs> um, any one anther has the amount of pollen it's ever going to make uh, when, when the flower starts to open. But whether it, it allows it all to be available at once or one at a time, or whether this anther uh, matures today and this one tomorrow, that's where the, there's gonna be a sort of a gradual availability. And that's something the plants are controlling uh, for the most part. And so bees are very good at telling whether anthers have pollen in them and whether if they manipulate them in one way or another, they're going to be able to, to get the, um, the pollen out. So, that, that's something where uh, all the action's done ahead of time. Um, in a nutshell, nectar is more complicated and I'll, I will give you a quick version of, of what I, the way I look at it. Nectar is produced in roughly three main ways. One of them is the banquet uh, approach where if you remember, you go into a banquet hall and all the tables are full, full with food and we all go out there and we try to grab what we can. But when the plates are empty, the plates are empty. So some flowers, they open, there's nectar in there. And once it's been drank, that's it. It's a one shot deal. There's others where it's like a leaky faucet and there's a little nectar there. And if you, but if you come back in five minutes, there'll be a little more. And if you come back in five minutes, there'll be a little more. And they, the, uh, that, that can vary over time. Uh, you know, if it's a night pollinated plant, they'll produce more in the night. And, and so there could be temporal changes that way. But the leaky faucet is another way to look at it. The other one is the toilet. Uh, version where there's a filler valve, right? So there's a lot of nectar there, uh, uh, a lot of nectar there. Uh, a bee comes in and drinks it. It the 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 plant senses that and then f refills it until it's full and then stops. And that's been found in a couple of penstemons and some others, which is really dynamic. Uh, so th those are the so that that's highly variable the way plants replenish nectar. Uh, and you won't know till you check with your plants and most plants have never been checked. So you could uh, make novel contributions by figuring out uh, which of those is going on.